Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Changing the Learning Paradigm to Serve the Future Workforce. Our presenters today are Ian Klein, VP of Solutions Architecture at Hemsley Fraser. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm a longtime L&D person who has joined Hemsley Fraser in the past couple of years. So the same challenges and issues uh, you currently face, I faced for many, many years. Uh, I am from uh, coming to you live from the center of Manhattan, right north of Times Square. So you may hear sirens, I may put myself on mute, but thank you to Brandon Hall for this opportunity and thanks for everyone who's listening. I look forward to talking to you and getting your questions. Great, thank you. And Claude Werder, he is the Senior Vice President and Principal HCM Analyst at Brandon Hall Group. Hello, everybody. I would like to extend a thank you to Hemsley Fraser for sponsoring today's webinar. Hemsley Fraser is passionate about learning and transformative effect that it can have on the entire workplace experience. They have been in the learning space for nearly 30 years and for the past decade have been consistently ranked as one of the top 20 companies in the world for leadership development, digital content, and digital outsourcing. For those of you who aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, we are a research and analyst firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world through our research and tools. A quick mention that our HCM Excellence Conference will take place February 1st through 3rd in West Palm Beach, Florida. This is an in-person event, so be sure to visit our website for the latest information. Your participation in our surveys is one of the most crucial components for our research. If you see any surveys on our schedule that you'd like to participate in, it's always appreciated. And finally, a few logistics. This presentation is being recorded. The recording and slides will be provided to everyone within 24 hours of the webinar in a follow-up email. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing it in the question box for our presenters. And if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation instantly, you can find it in the handout section. So without further delay, let's hand it over to Claude to dive right in. Well, thank you, David, and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks to Hemsley Fraser for sponsoring. We're excited about talking about today's topic, changing the, the learning paradigm to serve the future workforce. And we're gonna break our presentation down into three main parts. First, we wanna talk about the, the, learn, the importance of learning and the impact of learning and the gap that exists and how we can bridge that. Uh, we wanna talk about return on investment, which a lot of people focus on in learning versus the return on engagement. And then really uh, the key to really changing the paradigm and meeting the needs of the future workforce is really about building a true learning ecosystem. So we're gonna spend time really throughout um, the presentation, but especially toward the end of really drilling down on that. So let's start on the next slide with uh, the current state based on our research. So Brandon Hall Group research shows that organizations find themselves in a challenging spot when it comes to learning a strategic role in the business. Now, on one hand, as shown in the blue square, more than three quarters of companies say that business leaders rate learning as highly important. This makes it clear that learning is a priority in, in a critical success level. However, on the other side, only 45% of companies rate themselves highly on how integral learning is to the organization's culture. And this is driven by learning's seeming disconnect with the business in many cases. Learning strategies are not always properly aligned with business outcomes, and the actual process of learning seems to many employees, and we talk to a lot of them, as, as if it is completely divorced from their jobs, kind of something separate from what they do every day. So ensuring that learning is personal, relatable, and easy to access within the flow of work will make it more impactful and sustainable. Well, that disparity in the two numbers really strikes me. I think certainly everyone on this call, and again, three quarters of business leaders realize how important learning is, but the fact that less than half of organizations think that the learning is, is not only integral to the culture, but integral to where the business is trying to go, it it's just stunning. It's it's not surprising at all. We all know that it is very challenging for learning professionals to truly 
get that seat at the table. And Claude and I will talk a little bit later on what learning professionals can do to get that seat at the table. At Hemsley Fraser, really, we've learned that there is no silver bullet to making sure that there's no one silver bullet really to make sure that that learning is completely tied. The learning that's being offered is completely tied to business initiatives. There, there are a lot of different strategies, everything from greater stakeholder management to um, making sure that that every single learning intervention that happens is directly tied to a, a critical competency or a business need. And we've been working with lots of organizations that are just now starting on their journey to making sure that L&D is really in lockstep with the business. But again, there's a way to go. We, we clearly are on the beginning of a much longer journey. Yeah, we, we definitely are, but the momentum is really there. You know, 82% of companies say they're working on improving their approach to, to making learning more personalized and contextualized. And the pu push to do so is coming from both sides, according to our research. You know, 70% of companies say learners are asking for the change, and 64% say the business is asking for the change. So that's a really good sign. But the key, of course, is execution. And that's what we hope to really provide insights uh, for you today. So a logical question is whether organizations are really ready to develop learning that has more direct impact on the business. And we looked at this in our, in our research and 55% of organizations consider themselves ready for change. But what that means is something different for, for every organization. Uh, and which I think you know talk to in a minute, and that only 47% of organizations believe they are culturally ready to take on more personalized learning that connects to the business more deeply. And what that means is that there needs to be a consensus across the organization that traditional learning is no longer sufficient, and it must be personalized and contextualized in ways that drive real impact on employee behaviors and performance. And to be culturally ready to take on personalized learning at scale, organizations must be prepared to take several critical steps. And this is a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. And the steps include, well, I'll just go over them quickly now. One, aligning the learning strategy with organizational business goals and the skills and competencies that employees need to help the business reach those outcomes. Two, apply principles of brain science to design learning experiences that are more likely to lead to behavior change. Three, uh, properly leverage the role of managers in the learning experience. Also, upgrade learning development and delivery processes so they're agile enough to keep up with the needs of the business. And leverage the tools and technologies needed to help facilitate personalized learning at scale. If I could jump in here for a second, Claude, a another thing Please that's important, again, thank you, is the disparity, uh, you know, that 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 forty five percent is it or forty seven? Sorry, my screen is blocked. The forty percent uh, percent of organizations that feel they're culturally ready to take on personalized learning at scale, and and the idea of of just only half of organizations feeling that they're change ready. The big question I have is, well, changing to become what? The change right. that we're experiencing now is so continual, so con so constant that every company we're working with at Hemsley Fraser, they're still coming to grips with what are the changes that we have to address. If you think of the transition from 2019 to 2020 through the pandemic, any number of changes had to happen at a time. And we see so many organizations that have programs called skills of the future or future ways of working, but that future itself is changing on a daily basis. The minute we all got used to working from home and not being together, just a few months later, organizations are trying to figure out how to live in a hybrid world. So the challenge becomes, how do you provide personalized learning when the solid ground that we all thought we were sitting on is shifting beneath, beneath our feet on, on a daily basis? Maybe the answer is not aiming toward a particular end point, but really helping all of our employees be agents of change to give them that learning agility, learning flexibility to say that whatever the change is, whatever the future is, we're teaching people how to adapt, how to learn and how to succeed and thrive through change. 
Right, and I know, Ian, you have a, an approach that Hamza Frazier uh, takes to this that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But before we do that, we want to get a, a sense of where you all are on in your journey of reducing this learning importance impact gap. I want to ask you a quick poll question. And the question is very simply, how would you rate your alignment of your corporate learning strategy and business objectives. We gave you four choices. A, we're in near perfect alignment. Everything is wonderful. Number two, we're making significant strides. Uh, C, uh, we're early in our journey. And last, there's little if any alignment. And we're interested in seeing where you fall. Uh, and this also helps us to, to maybe tweak our approach a little bit depending on where uh, the majority of the audience is in the journey. David, you can let me know when. Uh, I'm looking when forward to, to uh, this poll in real time. I think that'll be very interesting. Yeah, it, uh, it's always good for us because we ask these 10 of these re questions in our research, and so it's nice to see what a smaller sample uh, and what they do. So, uh, I would say that this is fairly close to, to where our research turned out is uh, the majority, 42% are early in the journey, 21% really not any alignment at all, but 30% uh, really 30 are making uh, significant strides, which is really good. And it's pretty, pretty normal that less than 10% are, are really in very good alignment. So I think for those of you who are further along, I hopefully will uh, have some more wisdom and insights to share to help you along your journey. And for those who are just getting started, uh, I think we have a lot that uh, they can help you. So that, with that, let's move on uh, to the, the next slide where uh, we uh, Ian will uh, continue in drilling down here. Sure, and and I'll just comment. And and David, don't don't you don't have to move back to the previous slide, but I'll comment. There is absolutely nothing wrong with and and i applaud everyone who said they're they're at the beginning of of their journey so many so many companies are because for so long and and throughout most of my career business strategy business implementation was was set so far apart from learning and development which which is really um housed and and still is frequently housed within hr that understanding of linking learning and development to the business leaders and to what their priorities are I, i'm not going to say it's a relatively new thing but but it, it, you know organizations are very very large ships to turn and for anyone who's even started on that journey I, I i applaud you for for this uphill challenge that we're all facing and doing well with but anyway on on this slide uh i, I don't really want to focus on hemsley fraser um, as a business so much as talk about our 4e approach which we think that any learning, learning and organizational development team can focus on. It is the way to turn the dial. It is the way to make sure that your investment in learning dollars really pays off, both qualita qualitatively and quantitatively in, in terms of business impact. So the four E's are on the screen here, starting with Excite. You need to get immediately alignment from your business stakeholders. Uh, why am I, as a, as a manager, as a leader, going to allow my people off the desk not doing their daily work to get the learning? You have to make it clear to the business why this learning is valuable, how the skills they will get during the training will tie back to the day-to-day, -day, will turn the, turn the dial for the business. Getting stakeholders involved early sometimes feels like it slows things down because there's another set of opinions to listen to, I think it's the reverse. If you get the buy-in of your business leaders early, it smooths the way in so many different areas from getting people to be engaged, from getting people to sign up, for actually holding those accountable who may not uh, attend the learning. When you get the buy-in of the managers, it smooths every last, every last thing that happens. You also need to excite the learners too. We are bombarded by so many different messages, uh, both internally and externally, regular day-to-day -day emails, marketing messages, governmental messages, health messages, that the messaging about our learning programs is usually just one in a, in a sea of thousands, tens of thousands of messages. So we've got to make it clear to the learners, what's in it for me? 
what's in it for me if I take the time away from what I know my boss wants me to do and, and learn? We've got to create and think like we're a marketing agency and really create the compelling message that is as compelling as any marketing message you see. Time in front of a trainer, a facilitator, an expert is, is precious. We only have so many hours in the day. If we're gonna take people away from their day-to-day -day jobs, we've got to engage them by learning that is inspirational, that is compelling. We are way past the time where people can just speak to a bunch of PowerPoint notes and show bullets, bullet after bullet after bullet for a couple of hours and expect anyone to pay attention or get real value from that. So we need to, as, as learning leaders, offer opportunities for people to learn not only from the expert facilitators, but from each other, sharing real life stories. And thirdly, we all know now that, that learning is not just an event, a single moment in time. Learning is a journey. Going to a class, a workshop, a course is fantastic, but it means exactly zero if people aren't then given the chance to embed those skills and practice those skills. A couple of ways we do that, of course, we have post-work assignments, action learning, but one way that we find really valuable is by building into program design um, a series of meetings with the learners and their managers. So the manager can give the learner opportunities to apply what they've learned, but also we frequently recommend building into our programs a concept of accountability partners a training buddy that's gone through the same learning with you that acts as just another voice to help you practice and prepare for conversations and keep each other honest that you're actually applying what you've learned. And Evolve, our, our final of the four E's, is really an understanding that, as I said before, the, the situation, the business landscape is changing on a daily basis. We cannot expect to launch a program and let it run for three, four, or five years without really looking at it carefully to see if it's still fit for purpose. So using our communications uh, to the best of our ability to edit the way and adjust the way we're reaching our audiences, looking at the data that we're getting back with, um, with uh, skill evaluations and return on expectation programs to make sure that we're evolving where we need to to make sure that it is still just as viable in year three as the learning was in year one. Claude, I hope that didn't take too much time, but if I could, I'd like to spend just a couple of more minutes talking about one program that, that uh, Brandon Hall is, is well aware of, and we're very, very honored to have won a bronze award in 2021 for applying these concepts to Amgen, one of the world's largest biopharmaceutical corporations. Uh, how does that sound to you, Claude? Sounds great. Yeah, okay. love to hear it. And I'll continue. Amgen uh, is, is a wonderful partner of Hemsley Fraser's for several years. And a few years ago, they came to us with what we thought was a really fascinating challenge. We had built for Amgen a curriculum of about, I want to say, between seven and 11 live workshops. And they were expert-led, facilitated by Hemsley Fraser Associates. And they they really, really worked well. Amgen was very happy. The challenge they gave us in 2019 was, can you bring this experience to our entire global audience? Because we had only been able to offer these live learning experiences to the offices where there were 20, 30, 40, or 50 people that could take a, a, a course at a time. How can we scale this learning that you've been able to give us, but to a global audience without costing many, many, many millions of dollars. And, and how do you do that where some of our offices are really tiny and it will never be feasible to bring 30 people together and it will never be people feasible to fly people all, all over the world? How can we keep that level of interaction between facilitators and learners together? So we embarked on uh, a new project called Learning for Growth 2.0. The original was called Learning for Growth. And the real key win here, I think, was realizing, and this is before the pandemic, but realizing that, that learning needs are changing, we did a few things. Number one, with Excite, we really, really changed the way that all of these programs were offered. It became much more than just a catalog and a bunch of emails, but we really turned up the marketing messaging that 
Learning for Growth is an opportunity to build your career at Amgen or get ready for your next step wherever you are. We built learning journeys to show that we're not just offering drips and drabs. Every workshop that you take is part of a learning journey that'll help you be a better communicator, a better manager, a better program manager. We replace those live one-day in-person workshops with half-day live, work live virtual workshops by completely breaking the need to be in a physical space on one day at one time, so many things happened. It made it so much more financially um, feasible for managers at Amgen all over the world to allow their employees to attend. It meant that we were helping knit together the entire Amgen global learning community because all of a sudden, People in Amsterdam were able to learn with people in Germany, London, even people in China. And yes, we do offer classes in language all over the world, but in many cases, you're now being exposed to, to people uh, that you may never have been exposed to before. That combined with, in March 2020, the launch of the Amgen Learning Hub on Hemsley Fraser's LXP, which, give, which gave all of Amgen's uh, employees just-in-time learning access to micro-learning assets, animations, infographics, videos, uh, electronic playbooks. This was a game changer. If I'm sure we all remember March of 2020 was a very challenging time. We didn't skip a beat because we had already planned on turning the learning from live to virtual, and we lit up this uh, learning experience program, sorry, this learning experience platform, the hub, which sat very neatly alongside Amgen's existing platforms. Everyone had access to the learning they needed to grow their career at any given time. And we really found such an increase, or we, we realized what a, what a vast interest in self-study learning with, and it says here right on the screen, 50,000 online learning resources reviewed in just year one alone. We're into year two of the platform, that number keep, uh, keeps increasing. Has it worked? Absolutely, it has. We continue every year to refresh that primary learning for growth curriculum. We are about to embark on our, our third year worth of, of, um, of deliveries, but this methodology, this 4E methodology has been adopted by a lot of other learning teams at Amgen. We are working on some pretty exciting uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives. We are now also applying the same methodology to our field, uh, our field, uh, sorry, Amgen's field-facing sales leaders. And we're seeing just, just, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm stammering here because I'm trying, there's so many different things we're seeing. We're seeing a vast increase in the learning among Amgen's senior managers, we find that these programs are now featured regularly on the Amgen weekly and monthly learning blasts. We are finding ways to really demonstrate the value of learning to the business at large. That is one of the great ways of getting a seat at the table is by demonstrating small successes and building from there. Claude, I'll stop and, I, and I'll, I'll happily turn it back to you. Yeah, this is a great story, and uh, we've had a few uh, questions come in about like what does personalized learning look like, and and how do you get away from training by PowerPoint, and um, a couple of others. And hopefully, uh, with this case study and then some of the data and other information that Ian has, uh, we'll begin to answer those questions. But keep them coming because we will save some time at the end uh, for questions. So let's move on to uh, some, some data now that I think is gonna relate to what Ian was talking about. Um, and this will enable us to drill down and reinforce some of the important uh, elements that you can take to deliver this higher business impact that we're talking about. So base, this uh, graphic is from our recent upskilling, reskilling research where more than 80% of organizations said the two most important elements are aligning learning with the personal and professional goals of the learners and highly aligning the learning with the business objective for the organization. So the, this is really the holy grail of this process. The bottom line here is that learning must have mutual benefit for both the employees taking the learning and the business. And that should really be the key question whenever you're designing learning programs or learning initiatives or what, what, whatever new project you have in mind is, 
is this going to help our employees? And of course, you need to know what employees want in order to answer that question. And is it also going to help the business reach uh, its goal? Now, if you look at the third bar on the chart, this data shows that managers play a major role in learning. And it's very important for them to provide frequent feedback and coaching to their team members about how they're doing in their jobs and what they want to do in the future. In addition, shown on the second bar from the bottom, it's important for managers to really be fully aware of the training their employees are involved in and then helping them to reinforce that training. So understand what, the, what courses they might be involved in or projects they might be involved in being able to reinforce that training and then help them apply what they've learned on the job. And this is something that we've, we found in our quanti qualitative research that is often missing. A couple other things, about three quarters of organizations also believe that it's important that learners rate the training experiences they participate in. And this isn't just about you know, satisfaction rating, which is one of, one of the questions um, that was asked. It's also providing feedback about what worked, what didn't, so the learning experience can continue to be iterated and improved over time. And then finally, uh, last point, and, uh, about two-thirds of organizations said it was important that learning needs to include multiple modalities, uh, so learners have a choice to some degree on how they access the learning. But Oh, we I'm have sorry. to be careful with that, right? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I was going to throw that to you, Ian. Yeah, you, we have to be careful with that last point, though. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to challenge that a bit. And, and obviously, we have uh, learners in all of our programs with different preferred learning styles. I also want to, to, get, to give a shout out, really, to the fact that we really have a, a duty, a responsibility, and an honor to make sure that as time goes on, our learning programs are more and more accessible to people who have uh, different visual needs, different hearing acuity. We, we have to make sure that our programs are as accessible as possible. That being said, um, sometimes I think there is a push to make for any given piece of learning, a video, a large workshop, a class, when you know a, a two paragraph handout will do. I think it's not a one size fits all. Assuming that we're addressing different learning styles, assuming that we are monitoring and making the learning as welcome for people with different abilities as possible. Throwing the kitchen sink at every last learning solution just doesn't work. I, I can remember an experience where I sat through a, a 60 minute video. Really the takeaway was about two sentences. That running 5,000 people through a 60 minute video where it yeah. could have been done in two sentences, you're never going to see a bill for that, but it translates, if you actually add up everyone's salary by the hour, wow, that was an expensive video. So just, just keep that yeah. in mind when we're building learning. Yeah, no, point really well taken. And, there, and I, I've seen this in our work with our clients that the people tend to overreact to having multiple modalities. They need to be strategic. They need to be appropriate for what you're trying to teach. Videos can be, to use to build on Ian's example, videos can be very impactful in, in, in a research rate right toward the top, but not if they're 60 minutes, right? The, 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 the video that works is like a two to three mini uh, video that illustrates something, tells people how to do something, shows them how to do something. Those are the kind of things that work. So multiple modalities should be on your to-do list, but very strategically and focused specifically uh, to what you're trying to accomplish with the learning. So moving on to the next slide, we've talked about what's important, but what are some of the, the, big, the big challenges? And right at the top is that many managers are not good coaches and are not connected to what their employees are learning, uh, which is a, a major problem when we're trying to reinforce and, and involve them in everything. I'm not surprised at that, Claude. Uh we do as a recommendation, Hemsley Fraser, we, we always build into any frontline or even mid-level leadership program, uh, a coaching workshop. And I, I, I wish we could demonstrate this live, but the very best, the very best um, exercise in class I've ever found is you, you line up people in pairs and you have them throw paper airplanes. Whoever flies their plane the furthest has to coach the other partner 
on how to you know get a get their plane to fly farther but every single time but every single time the person who is designated as the coach doesn't actually coach the other person they actually teach the other person how to make a copy of their own airplane so a lot of times managers have you know have have spent 10 20 30 years in the business thinking they're coaching they're actually teaching and coaching right that's the thing that 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 helps their staff grow coaching allows coaching is the great accelerator so i i would agree with that we we have to break people out of the paradigm of of when they think they're coaching but they're not yeah i'm not going to go through all of these these challenges uh, but we'll have the slide but i want to go through a, a couple of others uh, one is, is that uh, many organizations challenge, and we're going to talk more about this, to get their hands around having the right technology ecosystem in place. And you need technology that enables you to develop a range of learning that meets the needs of the business and the learners. So without the right technology, it's, it's really difficult to go beyond this one-size-fits-all learning that a lot of organizations are locked into. Um, which is, of course, just not sufficient to, to upskill and reskill the future workforce. And then one more, just in the second column of the slide, a little less than half of organizations say they struggle because they don't know how to develop and deliver personalized learning at scale. And a lot of the questions that we're getting are asking exactly like that. And, and there's really no surprise that they don't know how to do that, right, Ian? Well, no, because a, a, a great mentor of mine once told me if, if everything if, if all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail and the reason i'm using that hokey phrase is we have for for decades myself included have been taught to think of learning is a full day class in a classroom with a powerpoint backing and, and that's it the rise of youtube and linkedin learning and all sorts of micro now even nano learning have really challenged what does it mean to provide a learning experience? I think a lot of companies are struggling with the shift because in many cases, a lot of the economic buyers remember that learning means a classroom experience. And it's only now that both the heads of learning departments and the economic buyers recognize that an infographic can be a, a really valid piece of learning. Um, a short two minute video, as you mentioned, is a valid piece of learning. A checklist, a job aid is a valid piece of learning. We're all in the middle of that shift. But before we talk more about the different micro learning bits, I'd like to spend some more time, and David, if you'd be so kind as to shift to the next slide, just this one other thing that takes a little bit more time up front, but really pays off dividends at the end. And that is focusing from the very kickoff, from day one of your learning programs on return on engagement. And what I mean by that is, if at the end of the year, we have any hope to go back to our senior leaders who gave us the budget, who gave us the investment dollars for the training. If we're going to have any hope at telling them a story that really speaks to what they were hoping to see, we need to understand what they were looking for straight right at the beginning, and we need to plan to measure those things. So at Hemphley Fraser, we use, it's got a lot of syllables here, reverse Kirkpatrick Brinkerhoff, but it's basically just our ROE, ROE model, which says, before we build anything, before we design any training, before we offer any training, we've got to ask ourselves using those Kirkpatrick levels one through four, what is the goal here? So the question we always go back to our stakeholders is Kirkpatrick level four. As you know, what are you hoping to see? What are the changes you're hoping to see in your business as a result of this training? Then if those are the results you want to see, let's take it a step back. What behaviors do you need to see your people doing in order to generate those results? All right, if these are the behaviors we want to see, what learning do we have to give people to help them change their behaviors? And then, of course, how do we drive people to learning? How do we make people engage with that learning? By that phase one here, and it's, it's not complicated, so it's a bunch of very simple questions. We're getting our learning stakeholders and their business stakeholders to think about what is the end goal here because then after the learning we're going to have to figure out can we measure all these things so again before we design develop and deploy the training how are we going to check reaction is it an l1 smile sheet or are we asking for stories how will we know that we've learned they've learned what we wanted them to learn how are we going to monitor in the business the behavior and how are we going to check on the results 
the big piece in this section three, which, which stops a lot of ROE programs from happening is a lot of people come up with any different number of very complicated and, and, and uh, detailed metrics that are just, it's not sustainable for a very lean learning team to gather these things every month. So we always challenge in part three, only choose those metrics to measure what you're looking to measure that are readily available that you have the bandwidth and you have the ability to track. Otherwise, your ROE plan is, is dead right from the outset. At the end, in stage four, which is really talking about the narrative, I think we, we always think it's so critical to draw a direct line between investment dollars in training and bottom line business results. That is incredibly challenging. And unless you have an army of researchers and data, data statisticians, it's probably not likely. I think sometimes we forget that Stakeholders not only want numbers, but qualitative measures of ROE are also very important. What are the stories we're hearing? Did, is someone having an easier time serving a client? Have we, have we made the process of building whatever we build much easier? Go for the story, go for the narrative, as well as the numbers. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that and endorse the, this model. It's, it lies very, very closely to Brandon Hall Group's uh, learning performance convergence model. And the real basis of what we're talking about is simplifying measurement. Uh, we've had a couple questions already about measurement. I think people, as Ian referenced, make this a lot more complicated than it has to be. You start at the end. What is the business result you want to get from this? And then based on that, you design your learning, make it as impactful as possible, and then see if you have in fact reached that business objective or you're in the process of reaching that business objective and making progress toward it. It's really much simpler than I think a lot of folks have, have think it is. And it's, it's all about starting at the, at the end result and working backwards. Absolutely. So, so one of the things we're, we're always interested in is where people are with their, their measurements. So we want to ask a full question about that real quickly. And so asking you which of the following uh, phrases best describes your typical approach to measuring the impact of learning. Is it A, that you're really still focused on completions and satisfaction only? Or two, that you focus on acquiring knowledge? Or three, knowledge applied on the job? Or four, impact, you're measuring the impact on business outcomes that we just talked about. So we'll see how things turn out, but um, so far, unless the percentages change dramatically as I see them coming in, um, pretty pretty encouraging result here. So we'll let the some more votes come in, and then we'll we'll let you take a look. Uh, I'll be honest. In my many years as uh, head of a learning function, we didn't get that much further than completions and satisfaction, I was even surprised to learn that some of my stakeholders, and this was five or 10 years, I think because they were so overwhelmed, as Claude said, about measuring ROE that besides smile sheets, besides L1 uh, interventions, or sorry, L1 reactions, they, they didn't really ask us to do much more. I think now that I've been with Hemsley Fraser and I'm realizing it, it, it's not that it's incredibly easy, but it's a lot easier than I think we we think it's a, a sort of Damocles. We think it's this giant boulder rushing toward us. It's not that bad. We, we, we've been starting to develop some real measures of results that work well. But I'd love to see what everyone says. Well, yeah, the results are making me smile because the, the most frequent answer is actually that they're measuring impact on business outcomes. 30% say they're measuring impact of learning on business outcomes, which is tremendous. <laughs> So congratulations to everybody who's there, and that should be encouragement to to those of you who are you know working toward that that you can really make progress here. And uh, th that's an exciting result. That's the first time that I've I've seen that result uh, on a on a poll like this. So that's great to see. Excellent. It means we're making progress. So now let's, let's shift gears a little bit, and, and I want to talk about uh, the companies that believe that they're already changing their learning paradigms. In other words, they're having some success. So right now, according to our research, half of companies believe that their approach to learning, like a lot of the things we've been talking about, 
that their approach is positioning them to meet the future of work requirements. And so what we did when we got that percentage of organizations that believe they're where they need to be, or at least very much headed in the right direction, we analyzed that data to, to come up with the things that these companies do differently than companies who are struggling. And there's five things we found. One, they have the technology ecosystem in place to deliver and, de and develop, de develop and deliver personalized learning at scale. So as we mentioned, technology is really important. If, if you don't have the right technology, we can talk all day long, but you're not gonna be able to pull it up. Number well, two. Oh, Claude, oh, go sorry, ahead. Let me just jump in there. Yeah. Quick, think of uh, sure. think of television and how long it took television to go from we've got three networks, everybody watches the same thing to now, you have a personalized dashboard of every show you could possibly choose to watch, and that has done nothing but drive TV watching up. We're in that same exact space right now in learning. Do you have the one size fits all learning solution, or does your learning technology enable everyone? to have that level of choice? That's a real question out there right now. Agreed. The other thing, that the second thing, is you need to have a good handle on what learners' needs are and what drives them. And this requires some design thinking, talking to learners through surveys and focus groups and even individual interviews and understanding what would make learning more engaging and rewarding for them. So this goes well, well beyond smile sheets and if they're satisfied with what they, they had, consumed in terms of learning, but really understanding what they want, what they need, and then developing and executing on a strategy to improve. Real quick, Claude, I'll tell you what we do is for most of our large scale programs, we very much recommend to our stakeholders, our, our clients, that they include representatives of the ultimate learning audience in the development team of, of the program. If we don't build for the audience, we're, we're, and we don't include them, we don't really know what they need, we're shooting in the dark. Yep, absolutely. Number three, and this is probably the heaviest lift for organizations, is these successful organizations have managers who are good coaches, and they know what their employees are learning. For many companies, they just really struggle with this, because you can't just snap your fingers and say, okay, we're going to make our managers better coaches. There needs to be a mindset that coaching and feedback are part, an integral part of a manager's job. And that type of uh, of change is sometimes a culture shift that requires clear messaging and training. It's not going to happen overnight. You have to have a plan. And organizations that we've seen have success in this area have really seen it as a culture change initiative and invested significant time and resources in creating a coaching culture among their managers and their employees. Yeah, I'm not going to add much here. I, I, I can't stress enough. Uh, the engine for for individual and team growth is managers knowing how to coach. Yep. And you also need to find the right content uh, in the marketplace. You know, L and D departments, no matter how talented, no matter uh, the types of designs they have in mind and, and creative ideas, there are limited resources, and they can't possibly meet all the learning needs of the organization without. Uh, content uh, often from external vendors. So targeting the content they need help with and finding the right vendors for their needs becomes a critical competency for L&D teams. Yeah, I thought when I was running a learning department that I really had to build everything myself. But of course, like many others, I was such a lean team that th there's no way for any one lean organization learning team, unless you have hundreds of, of learning professionals on your team to build everything you need. There are fantastic content partners out there that run the gamut from very, very focused um, topic areas to, to generalists that can offer many different topic areas and, and people that focus on, on leadership and management and business skills like Hemsley Fraser. I will just say that the curation of the learning you buy is, is critical. Giving people access to 300, 400,000 learning resources, whether it's live or self-study is, is throwing them adrift in a sea of information, curating that learning, helping them understand and contextualize the learning opportunities you're giving your employees. That, that, that's part of the key. That's part of the key to success. Yep, that's a, that's a critical piece of it. And thanks for uh, focusing on that. And the fifth thing that these successful organizations do uh, better than others is 
They promote peer-to-peer -peer collaborative learning. In other words, no matter how great the content is that you develop, internally or externally, it can't replace the value of having your employees learn from each other as well. And high-performing L&D organizations that we've interviewed empower their employees in various ways to collaborate and learn as they work. Yeah, and just one last thing there, Claude. If I think about how I spend my free time, um, well, a, a lot of it's on social media, and I am liking things that my friends post on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, and other places, and I am sharing the content that I find funny, interesting, or, or valuable. We've got to create a learning ecosystem where, where learners can do the same, and share the best stuff with their work colleagues. I'll, uh, I'll just talk a bit, and actually, um, this really turns out, it, it's just where it is, the slide is in our presentation, but people ask, how do you build personalized learning? How do you get away from just PowerPoint slides with bullets? We at Hemsley Fraser have found that, that there are any number of building blocks. Um, think, think Lego or Connects or any, any other type of building blocks that you like, but Learning is not one size fits all. Some people love presentations like this one where um, you're hearing from experts and you're asking questions in direction. For others like me personally, I like to read. Just, just give me something in text that I can rip through in a few minutes. For others are more visual infographics. What we've built in our organization are a series of about five, 6,000 different building blocks that any organization can quickly pick and choose and build the learning program of their choice. So as you, as you think about how to break away from that everything is PowerPoint model, just think of all the different ways you learn personally from an IKEA pictorial manual when you buy a bookshelf, from a YouTube video showing you how to fix that setting on your, on your Apple Watch or your iPhone, to peer interactions and peer discussions where someone who's very successful shows you what they do in a video. Micro learning and nano learning, in fact, are, are really the road to the future of corporate learning, I think. Yeah, this is all very important. And it's all tied into this, this next slide, uh, which I'm just gonna touch on because uh, I wanna save some time for questions and learning a little bit behind, but it's really important as you evaluate learning and you work on the building blocks and all the things that we're talking about that you really take make an effort to see learning and employee development overall through your employee's eyes. We, we all have a, a tendency to look at things through our own filter. And it's important that employees uh, should feel uh, certain things, and it's listed on the slide. I won't go over every one, but you know, they, real quickly, they, they need to feel fully supported. You know, they need to feel that the organization is committed to developing them and to give them the learning they need. And they need to feel that they have the opportunities to practice new skills and to collaborate. And, just because you think that you're doing that now doesn't mean that they think that, that you're doing that now. And I think really connecting with learners and making sure that you're seeing it through their eyes is really important. Every one of these elements are important and that requires a true learning ecosystem. Well, thank you for that, uh, that, that really great segue. So look, Hemsley Fraser is not the only learning partner out there. There, there are several others who I'm sure have their own approach at, at really what works for a modern uh, learning ecosystem technology-wise. I would just like to share you what, what we offer because it, it's, it, it's one method that does work. Everything that Claude and I have been saying only works, as Claude said, with the right technology. So our learning platform, our learning experience platform called The Hub, really, uh, and it's very similar to the interfaces you use when you go home at night, you turn on your smart TV or you use your iPad or, or any other device. It is a very consumer friendly, simple tile thumbnail based learning experience platform that, that puts all the content in one place, whether it's Hemsley Fraser content, your own content or third party content from any of your learning libraries. We make it all accessible to your learners. So they really feel that they have that ability to choose what learning is important for them. Yes, of course, we can have very programmatic learning journeys that direct people through uh, a, a planned program, but when you have five or 10 minutes only to learn, you wanna feel that you have that choice. And we're, we're definitely giving you that choice, not only to our content, but very, very, uh, very many other people's content as well. 
And it's that social learning, which Claude mentioned uh, a, a couple of minutes ago, that's so important. You can, just like with Facebook or with Spotify, with Netflix, you can like content, you can share content, comment on it, um, even recommend or request changes on it. That social sharing, learning from your friends, learning from your colleagues, pays dividends because it, we, we, we trust who we know, we trust who we like, we get, we get very valuable learning from them as well. And just one other piece here I'd like to talk about on this slide is that, is that curation. We've got, it says here, 4,000 online learning assets plus a couple of thousand of our instructor-led and expert-led learning options. You can, you can rest assured with the right LXP that you're not dumping your people into a sea of content, but everything here has been curated to match the latest accessibility guidelines, the latest adult learning guidelines, and will match your, your, uh, your live learning workshops the content in that will match what's on your LXP. If you wouldn't mind, David, just switching to the next slide. A lot of companies ask us when they work with us, you know, we've invested hundreds of thousands, even millions in content libraries in an LMS. Does that mean we have to throw it all away? Uh, I would, as, as an individual and as a rep of Hemsley Fraser said, no, of course not. Um, we would never recommend you throw away what's working. LMSs, traditional LMSs, of course, have a place. They're really spectacular for uh, required training, for compliance training, and for very, very detailed technical learning. Content libraries, again, you can't build everything you need. We can't build everything you need. It's, it's best to pull in best of breed content from everywhere. What we think a good LXP like our hub will do is provide that single dashboard, that single very comfortable place right in the middle that gives you both the choice to take whatever learning you want, but also help very gently direct you and guide you through what could just be a sea of micro learning assets. So don't ever feel that your investment in traditional technology still doesn't have a place. We just think there's a great way to knit your old style learning programs and the new style learning programs together in a very learner centric mobile friendly way. Claude, let me ask you a question. Do you see that um, people who work with Brandon Hall are, I don't want to say reluctant, but is there a barrier to entry to looking at LXPs and other newer platforms because they're so heavily invested in LMS platforms and traditional learning libraries? We, we certainly run into that, yes, and we try to, to tell them that, you know, this, it's an evolution and, and, and there's a way to, to integrate different solutions and uh, it, it's truly, a, like everything else that we're talking about, really a journey and they shouldn't be held back by that. Let's, uh, we're running a little short of time, I wanted to save a little time for at least a couple of questions, but um, we ask some critical questions that, that you can ask yourselves. I'm not going to go through all of these here, but the, the one critical thing that we want to focus on at the end here is, you know, asking yourself, is your learning strategy well aligned with both the learner and the organizational outcomes? And if we jump to the next slide, and you've got the other questions you can look at afterwards, is we, we really boil this down to, to about five steps to uh, learning strategy alignment. One, as we and this is kind of a wrap up of what we've talked about before, so we'll just touch on these things. One is including business leaders and other stakeholders in strategy development. You know, L and D got to be plugged into those business strategies. Many learning functions don't have a so-called seat at the table, so that they're not hearing all the time what business leaders are thinking, what they're planning. You need to find a way to change that somehow. Absolutely. Just just very briefly, and then I know we're short on time. I, I, I've lived it where we don't feel like we have a seat at the table. Well, there are, there are two real ways to get that seat at the table. Number one is by not dictating to the business anything. It, it's to really listen to them and, and offer them solutions. It's very easy to say to the business, you're doing it wrong. It's much harder, but ultimately much more valuable to get them excited and say, look, we're we're not here to do our own stuff. We're here only in support of you. How can we help? What, what outcomes are you looking for? And number two, and I said this a little bit earlier, is 
small successes and small bits of momentum breeds more success, breeds more momentum. Um, get some small wins under your belt and truly you'll start to see the stakeholders turn turn their turn their eyes towards you. So to drill down just uh, on these uh, learning strategy alignment steps uh, real quickly before we move into at least one question is include learner feedback and not just the satisfaction surveys, but detailed feedback, give learners the what's in it for me connection. Um, you know, several organizations that we work with have learner councils that provide feedback on learning initiatives, even as they're being developed, so that L&D can iterate even before the content is released. And um, moving on from the from the outset, as we talked about in the model, define business metrics that's going to help you understand how learning is driving business results. Build a technology roadmap, that ecosystem that we talked about does not happen overnight. You may need to do it over months or even years, and uh, you need a, a plan. And then understand that alignment drives engagement, and engagement in turn drives business results. And the bottom line is that our research shows that organizations where the learning strategy aligns with both business and learner objectives are four times more likely to say their strategy is effective in achieving business outcomes. Ian, any final comments before we move into a couple of questions in the couple of minutes remaining? I just say we're we're definitely seeing that with with Amgen and with other organizations uh, through our data insight reporting from our from our hub and and just from our expert led classes, from all the communications and promotional work. We've seen programs that had stalled at about a 6% engagement level. When we apply the four E's, it's gone above 20, 25% this year. Programs that had been doing well are now doing much, much better with, with engagement, upwards of 50, 60% of, of learners. So we are really looking to see a 2022 where we can really analyze both qualitatively and, and quantitatively, really provide some great stories about all the hard work our clients and our partners did with us in 2021. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the questions that have come in. I th hopefully we've, we've um, answered uh, most of them in, in, this, in the uh, flow of conversation. The one that I would like to uh, time allows to get at is this one. And, and Ian, it's, what's the trick of getting people to attend the classes that they hold, I assume, virtual at this point. We schedule a lot of programming, the things we know people and the business both want, but demand just isn't there and we wind up canceling a lot. Well, this, that's a great question. Uh, on both sides of the table, I've, I've definitely faced that. And I, I think this, there is no one you know, simple answer. Several. One is first getting that manager buy-in. When, when the manager is clear they support the learner, it makes it immediately 50% more likely the learners will come. The days of thinking just because we built a great program, that means that in that plain text email that invites everyone, that means I send out one email, everyone's gonna come to it. That, 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 that's not really how it works in real life. If you think of any brand that you follow, there are hundreds if not thousands of touch points of that brand really reminding you over and over again, here's the value of our product. Here's what you'll get if you buy it. Now we don't want to send a thousand messages to our learners, but we really have to think consumer focused. What, what is, why is this learning worth my time? What do I get for going? We have to think like marketers about that. And, and the last thing I'd say is word of mouth. If, if we make every learning uh, intervention, every learning workshop exciting, the people who attend it will tell their friends, will tell their friends. So uh, it, it's a combination of a variety of things, but it's possible to keep cancellations uh, even during even during a crazy busy time in a pandemic fairly low. Yeah, and I think hopefully some of the things we've talked about today will, will enable you to, to help with that. And I think it's just not, I think embedded in that question too, is it's not just about classes. It's you change the different types of, of activities and approaches to learning, you're going to get a lot more involvement. You might not get somebody in a class, but you might get them in some other type of activity that's going to be just as helpful for them. 
Well, we're, we're out of time, and I just want to thank you so much, Ian, for, for your insights and for uh, Hemsley Fraser uh, sponsoring this. I've really enjoyed it. I hope all of you who tuned in did as well. Thank you, for, uh, as always, for tuning in to Brandon Hall Group webinars. We hope to see you again in another one soon. Thanks again to Hemsley Fraser, and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Claude. It's been great. Bye-bye.